The Argument of St. Paul's Epistle to the Galatians by Martin Luther. First of all, we must speak of the argument, that is, of the issue with which Paul deals in this epistle. The argument is this. Paul wants to establish the doctrine of faith, grace, the forgiveness of sins, or Christian righteousness, so that we may have a perfect knowledge and know the difference between Christian righteousness and all other kinds of righteousness. For righteousness is of many kinds. There is a political righteousness, which the emperor, the princes of the world, philosophers, and lawyers consider. There is also a ceremonial righteousness, which human traditions teach, as for example the traditions of the Pope and other traditions. Parents and teachers may teach this righteousness without danger because they do not attribute to it any power to make satisfaction for sin, to placate God, and to earn grace. But they teach that these ceremonies are necessary only for moral discipline and for certain observances. There is, in addition to these, yet another righteousness, the righteousness of the law, or of the Decalogue, which Moses teaches. We, too, teach this, but after the doctrine of faith. Over and above all these, there is the righteousness of faith, or Christian righteousness, which is to be distinguished most carefully from all others. For they are all contrary to this righteousness, both because they proceed from the laws of emperors, the traditions of the Pope, and the commandments of God and because they consist in our works, and can be achieved by us with purely natural endowments, as the scholastics teach, or from a gift of God. For these kinds of the righteousness of works, too, are gifts of God, as are all the things we have. But this most excellent righteousness, the righteousness of faith, which God imputes to us through Christ without works, is neither political nor ceremonial, nor legal, nor work righteousness, but is quite the opposite. It is a merely passive righteousness, while all the others listed above are active. For here we work nothing, render nothing to God. We only receive and permit someone else to work in us, namely God. Therefore, it is appropriate to call the righteousness of faith, or Christian righteousness, passive. This is a righteousness hidden in a mystery, which the world does not understand. In fact, Christians themselves do not adequately understand it or grasp it in the midst of their temptations. Therefore, it must always be taught and continually exercised, and anyone who does not grasp or take hold of it in the afflictions and terrors of conscience cannot stand. For there is no comfort or conscience so solid and certain as is this passive righteousness. But such is human weakness and misery that in the terrors of conscience and in the danger of death we look at nothing except our own works our worthiness, and the law. When the law shows us our sin, our past life immediately comes to our mind. Then the sinner, in his great anguish of mind, groans and says to himself, Oh, how damnably I have lived! If only I could live longer, then I would amend my life. Thus human reason cannot refrain from looking at active righteousness, that is, its own righteousness, nor can it shift its gaze to passive, that is, Christian righteousness, but it simply rests in the active righteousness. So deeply is this evil rooted in us, and so completely have we acquired this unhappy habit. Taking the advantage of the weakness of our nature, Satan increases and aggravates these thoughts in us. Then it is impossible for the conscience to avoid being more seriously troubled, confounded and frightened. For it is impossible for the human mind to conceive any comfort of itself, or to look only to grace amid its consciousness and terror of sin, or consistently to reject all discussion of works. To do this is beyond human power and thought. Indeed, it is even beyond the law of God. For although the law is the best of all things in the world, it, it still cannot bring peace to a terrified conscience, but makes it even sadder and drives it to despair. For by the law, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Therefore the afflicted conscience has no remedy against despair and eternal death except to take hold of the promise of grace offered in Christ, that is, the righteousness of faith, this passive or Christian righteousness which says with confidence, I do not seek active righteousness. I ought to have and perform it, but I declare that even if I did have it and perform it, I cannot trust in it or stand up before the judgment of God on the basis of it. Thus I put myself beyond all active righteousness, 
all righteousness of my own or of the divine law, and I embrace only that passive righteousness, which is the righteousness of grace, mercy, and the forgiveness of sins. In other words, this is the righteousness of Christ and of the Holy Spirit, which we do not perform but receive, which we do not have but accept, when God the Father grants it to us through Jesus Christ. As the earth itself does not produce rain and is unable to acquire it by its own strength, worship, and power, but receives it only by a heavenly gift from above, so this heavenly righteousness is a gift to us by God, without our work or merit. As much as the dry earth of itself is able to accomplish in obtaining the right and blessed rain, that much can we men accomplish by our own strength and works to obtain that divine, heavenly, and eternal righteousness. Thus we can obtain it only through the free imputation and indescribable gift of God. Therefore, the highest art and wisdom of Christians is not to know the law, to ignore works and all active righteousness, just as outside the people of God the highest wisdom is to know and study the law, works, and active righteousness. It is a marvelous thing and unknown to the world to teach Christians to ignore the law and to live before God as though there were as though there were no law, whatever. For if you do not ignore the law, and thus direct your thoughts to grace, as though there were no law, but as though there were nothing but grace, you cannot be saved. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. On the other hand, works and the performance of the law must be demanded in the world, as though there were no promise of or grace. This is because of the stubborn, proud, and hard-hearted before whose eyes nothing must be said except the law, in order that they may be terrified and humbled. For the law was given to terrify and kill the stubborn and to exercise the old man. Both words must be correctly divided according to the apostle. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. This calls for a wise and faithful father who can moderate the law in such a way that it stays within its limits. For if I were to teach me and the law in such a way that they suppose themselves to be justified by it before God, I would be going beyond the limit of the law, confusing these two righteousnesses, the active and the passive, and would be a bad dialectician, who does not properly distinguish. But when I go beyond the old man, I also go beyond the law. For the flesh, or the old man, the law and works, are all joined together. In the same way, the spirit or the new man is joined to the promise and to grace. Therefore, when I see that a man is sufficiently contrite, oppressed by the law, terrified by sin, and thirsting for comfort, then it is time for me to take the law and active righteousness from his sight and to set forth before him, through the gospel, the passive righteousness which excludes Moses and the law and shows the promise of Christ who came for the afflicted and for sinners. Here a man is raised up again and gains hope, nor is he any longer under the law. He is under grace, as the Apostle says, Romans 6, verse 14. You are not under the law, but under grace. How not under the law? According to the new man, to whom the law does not apply. For the law had its limits until Christ, as Paul says below, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. The law and the Christ. When he came, Moses and the law stopped. So did circumcision, sacrifices, and the Sabbath. So did all the prophets. This is our theology, by which we teach a precise distinction between these two kinds of righteousness, the active and the passive, so that morality and faith, works and grace, secular society and religion may not be confused. Both are necessary, but both must be kept within their limits. Christian righteousness applies to the new man and the righteousness of the law applies to the old man, who is born of flesh and blood. Upon this latter, as upon an ass, a burden must be put that will oppress him. He must not enjoy the freedom of the Spirit or of grace unless he had first put on the new man by faith in Christ. But this does not happen fully in this life. Then he may enjoy the kingdom and the ineffable gift of grace. I am saying this in order that no one may suppose that we reject or prohibit good works, as the papists falsely accuse us, because they understand neither what they themselves are saying nor what we are teaching. They know nothing except the righteousness of the law, 
and yet they claim the right to judge a doctrine that is far above and beyond the law, a doctrine of which the carnal man is unable to pass judgment. Therefore it is inevitable that they be offended. For they cannot see any higher than the law. Therefore whatever is above the law is the greatest possible offense to them. We set forth two worlds, as it were, one of them heavenly, the other earthly. And to these we place these two kinds of righteousness, which are distinct and separated from each other. The righteousness of the law is earthly, and deals with earthly things. By it we perform good works, but as the earth does not bring forth fruit unless it has first been watered and made fruitful from above, for the earth cannot judge, renew, and rule the heavens, but the heavens judge, renew, rule, and fructify the earth, so that it may do what the Lord has commanded. So also by the righteousness of the law we do nothing even when we do much. We do not fulfill the law even when we fulfill it. Without any merit or work of our own, we must first be justified by Christian righteousness, which has nothing to do with the righteousness of the law or with earthly and active righteousness. But this righteousness is heavenly and passive. We do not have it of ourselves. We receive it from heaven. We do not perform it. We accept it by faith through which we ascend beyond all laws and works. As therefore we have borne the image of the earthly Adam, as Paul says, let us bear the image of the heavenly one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. Who is a new man in a new world, where there is no law, no sin, no conscience, no death, but perfect joy, righteousness, grace, peace, life, salvation, and glory. Then do we do nothing and work nothing in order to obtain this righteousness? I reply, nothing at all. For this righteousness means to do nothing, to hear nothing, and to know nothing about the law or about works, but to know and believe only this, that Christ has gone to the Father and is now invisible, that he sits in heaven at the right hand of the Father, not as a judge, but as one who has been made for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. In short, that he is our high priest, interceding for us and running over us and in us through grace. Here one notices no sin and feels no terror or remorse of conscience. Sin cannot happen in this Christian righteousness. For where there is no law, there cannot be any transgression. Romans chapter 4 verse 15. If therefore sin does not have a place here, there is no conscience, no terror, no sadness. Therefore John says, no one born of God commits sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. But if there is any conscience or fear present, this is a sign that this righteousness has been withdrawn, that grace has been lost sight of, and that Christ is hidden and out of sight. But where Christ is truly seen, there must be full and perfect joy in the Lord and peace of heart, where the heart declares, Although I am a sinner, according to the law, judged by the righteousness of the law, nevertheless, I do not despair. I do not die because Christ lives, who is my righteousness, and my eternal and heavenly life. In that righteousness and life I have no sin, conscience, and death. I am indeed a sinner, according to the present life, and its righteousness. As a son of Adam, where the law accused me, death reigns and devours me. But above this life I have another righteousness, another life, which is Christ, the Son of God, who does not know sin, and death, but his righteousness and eternal life. For his sake, this body of mine will be raised from the dead and delivered from the slavery of the law and sin and will be sanctified together with the Spirit. Thus, as long as we live here, both remain. The flesh is accused, exercised, saddened, and crushed by the active righteousness of the law. But the Spirit rules, rejoices, and is saved by the passive righteousness because it knows that it has a Lord sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father, who has abolished the law, sin, and death, and has trodden all evils underfoot, has led them captive, and triumphed over them in himself. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. In this epistle, therefore, Paul is concerned to instruct, comfort, and sustain us diligently in a perfect knowledge of this most excellent and Christian righteousness. For if the doctrine of justification is lost, the whole of Christian doctrine is lost. And those in the world who do not teach it are either Jews or Turks or Papists or sectarians. 
For between these two kinds of righteousness, the active righteousness of the law and the passive righteousness of Christ, there is no middle ground. Therefore, he who has strayed away from this Christian righteousness will necessarily relapse into the active righteousness that is, when he has lost Christ, he must fall into a trust in his own works. We see this today in the fanatical spirits and sectarians who neither teach nor can teach anything correctly about this righteousness of grace. They have taken the words out of our mouth and out of our writings, and these only they speak and write, but the substance itself they cannot discuss, deal with, and urge, because they neither understand it nor can understand it. They cling only to the righteousness of the law, therefore they are and remain disciplinarians of works, nor can they rise beyond the act of righteousness. Thus they remain exactly what they were under the Pope. To be sure they invent new names and new works, but the content remains the same. So it is that the Turks perform different works from the Papists, and the Papists perform different works from the Jews, and so forth. But although some do works that are more splendid, great, and difficult than others, the content remains the same, and only the quality is different. That is, the works vary only in appearance and in name, for they are still works, and those who do them are not Christians. They are hirelings, whether they are called Jews, Mohammedans, Papists, or sectarians. Therefore, we always repeat, urge, and inculcate this doctrine of faith or Christian righteousness, so that it may be observed by continuous use and may be precisely distinguished from the active righteousness of the law. For by this doctrine alone and through it alone is the church built, and in this it consists. Otherwise, we shall not be able to observe true theology, but shall immediately become lawyers, ceremonialists, legalists, and papists. Christ will be so darkened that no one in the church will be correctly taught or comforted. Therefore, if we want to be preachers and teachers of others, we must take great care in these issues and hold to this distinction between the righteousness of the law and that of Christ. This distinction is easy to speak of, but in experience and practice it is the most difficult of all. Even if you exercise and practice it diligently, for in the hour of death or in the other conflicts of conscience, these two kinds of righteousness come together more closely than you would wish or ask. Therefore, I admonish you, especially those of you who are to become instructors of consciences, as well as each of you individually, that you exercise yourself by study, by reading, by meditation, and by prayer, so that in temptation you will be able to instruct consciences, both your own and others. Console them and take them from the law to grace, from active righteousness to passive righteousness, in short, from Moses to Christ. In affliction and in conflict of conscience, it is the devil's habit to frighten us with the law and to set against us the consciences of sin, our wicked past, the wrath and judgment of God, hell and eternal death, so that thus he may drive us into despair, subject us to himself and pluck us from Christ. It is also his habit to set against us those passages in the gospel in which Christ himself requires works from us and with the plain words threaten damnation to those who do not perform them. If here we cannot distinguish between these two kinds of righteousness, if here by faith we do not take hold of Christ, who is sitting at the right hand of God, who is our life and our righteousness, and who makes intercession for us miserable sinners before the Father, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25, then we are under the law and not under grace, and Christ is no longer a Savior. Then he is a lawgiver. Then there can be no salvation left, but sure despair and eternal death will follow. Therefore, let us learn diligently this art of distinguishing between these two kinds of righteousness, in order that we may know how far we should obey the law. We have said above that in a Christian, the law must not exceed its limits, but should have its dominion only over the flesh, which is subjected to it and remains under it. When this is the case, the law remains within its limits. But if it wants to ascend into the conscience and exert its rule there, see to it that you are a good dialectician and that you make the correct distinction. Give no more to the law than it has coming and say to it, law, you want to ascend into the realm of conscience and rule there. You want to denounce its sin and take away the joy of my heart, which I have through faith in Christ. 
You want to plunge me into despair in order that I may perish. You are exceeding your jurisdiction. Stay within your limits and, ex and exercise your dominion over the flesh. You shall not touch my conscience, for I am baptized through the gospel. I have been called to a fellowship of righteousness and eternal life, to the kingdom of Christ in which my conscience is at peace. For there is no law but only the forgiveness of sins, peace, quiet, happiness, salvation, and eternal life. Do not disturb me in these matters. In my conscience, not the law will reign, that hard tyrant and cruel disciplinarian, but Christ, the Son of God, the King of peace and righteousness, the sweet Savior and mediator. He will preserve my conscience happy and peaceful in the sound and pure doctrine of the gospel and in the knowledge of this passive righteousness. When I have this righteousness within me, I descend from heaven like the rain that makes the earth fertile. That is, I come forth into another kingdom and I perform good works whenever the opportunity arises. If I am a minister of the word, I preach. I comfort the saddened, I administer the sacraments. If I am a father, I rule my household and my family. I train my children in piety and honesty. If I am a magistrate, I perform the office which I have received by divine command. If I am a servant, I faithfully tend to my master's affairs. In short, whoever knows for sure that Christ is his righteousness not only cheerfully and gladly works in his calling, but also submits himself for the sake of love to magistrates, also to their wicked laws, and to everything else in this present life, even if need be, to burden and danger. For he knows that God wants this, and that this obedience pleases him. So far the argument of the epistle, which Paul sets forth because of false teachers, who had obscured this righteousness of faith among the Galatians. Against them he asserts his authority and office.